Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, citizens of the planet Earth, welcome to Club Cosmos! That's a feisty crowd tonight. A feisty crowd tonight. Uh, thank you so much for coming on a cold uh, Tuesday night and tearing yourselves away from watching the budget. Uh, my name is Wilson De Silva and I'm editor of Cosmos, Australia's number one science magazine. And uh, we come to you tonight from the performance space at Carriage Works, uh, a suitably post-industrial setting uh, that is the centre of art innovation in the fair city of Sydney. Um, it's also the home of MasterChef, which is why we have, it's a perfect place for us to bring you a rich smorgasbord of ideas, a bountiful lasagna of future concepts, and maybe even a gumbo pot of uh, scientific predictions. Why? Because the topic tonight is from science fiction to science fact. Uh, is sci-fi inspired by science? And are all scientists secretly Star Trek fans busy making that future a reality? We're going to try and answer that for you tonight. Uh, these and many other questions. And we have assembled a distinguished panel to tackle this, I think, very important topic. Um, first, to my uh, immediate left is, a leading, is Barry Brook, who's a leading environmental scientist holding the Sir Hubert Wilkins Chair of Climate Change at the School of Earth Environmental Science. He's also director of, the, uh, climates, uh, director of Climate Science at the University of Adelaide's Environment Institute. He's actually come out here from Adelaide. Um, he has pub published three books, over 170 refereed scientific papers, and regularly writes for um, popular media in places like Cosmos, even. He has received a number of distinguished awards for his research um, excellence, including the Australian Academy of Science uh, Fenner Medal, and was awarded the 2010 Community Science Educator of the Year for his public outreach activities. His research and teaching interests centre on climate change, um, its impacts and uh, adaptation, computational statistic statistical modelling, systems analysis uh, for sustainable energy, and synergies between human impacts and biosphere, and he's a blogger. Check out bravenewclimate.com. Ladies and gentlemen, Barry Brook. To his immediate left uh, is an old friend of mine, uh, Brian Gainsler. He's an astronomer working as an ARC Federation Fellow and Professor of Physics at the Sydney Institute for Astronomy within the School of Physics at the University of Sydney. In July, he takes on two new roles as an Australian Laureate Fellow and as Director of the ARC Centre for Excellence for All Sky Astrophysics, which is called for short CASTRO. Um, I can see the T-shirt now. He undertook uh, postgraduate work at the University of Sydney at CSIRO's Australia Telescope National Facility, went on to do postdoctoral fellowships at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and at the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory before becoming an Associate Professor of Astronomy at Harvard and all this before he was 30, the bastard. <laughs> as a director of CASTRO, uh, Brian is working to establish Australia as a leader in wide field radio and optical astronomy and his CASTRO team aims to answer major unsolved problems in astronomy to develop innovative ways to process the enormous data sets that's going to be generated by things like the SKA, the Square Kilometre Array, and to enable a diverse set of opportunities for students and early career researchers. Brian Gainsler! <laughs> and, and to my extreme left, and I don't mean that politically, is uh, Mary Ann Williams. She's a roboticist. Uh, she's director of the Magic Lab, I love that name, Marianne, uh, and associate dean, research and development, in the Faculty of Engineering and IT at UTS. She has a passion for innovation, science, technology, and engineering. Uh, she's the coach of the robot soccer team, a, the, which is known as UTS Unleashed, and since 2002 has created and led seven robot soccer teams to outstanding success in the International Robot World Cup. Uh, some of you may be surprised there actually is an International Soccer World Cup, but there is. Um, this year, she will take human a humanoid robot team and a 3D robot simulation team to the 2011 Robot, robot Cup uh, Championships in Istanbul. Uh, Marianne works with her research team at UTS uh, to bring science fiction into reality, in a sense. Um, together, they explore robot learning, social robotics, which is the, the hot new thing in, in robotics right now, human-robot interaction, robot-robot collaboration, and bio-inspired robot cognition. Ladies and gentlemen, Marianne Williams.
Now, we are talking about science fiction, and, um, you know, it has, it has had a, a deep history stretching back. In fact, um, one of the things that you'll notice from this exhibit, if you've come, and you've only got until May 14, so do check it out, uh, this awfully wonderful um, exhibit. One of the things you find out is how back deep in time um, science fiction goes and um, how long people have been wondering about the future. So we're kind of, we're kind of going to tackle a number of things. It's, it's inspiration um, to scientists, um, its influence on science and, and science's influence on science fiction, but also its meaning to society. And uh, I guess I'm going to throw first to... Um, I've got a list here of all the science fiction that uh, our panellists are interested in, and I noticed that uh, right off the top, uh, Barry listed um, The Time Machine and Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. That seems like a very, it's very old world and very kind of new world comedy. So why, those, why, why that selection, Barry? Well, The Time Machine was really the, the first exploration of, of what the deep future could look like and a dystopian view of, of humanity. And that's sort of intriguing. And it also, also, from a biological perspective, and a lot of my research is in biology, it, it's a fascinating idea that the human race could split into these two very different forms. Because actually it was set in something like the year 10,000, uh, 700 the year 879,000. Oh, well, 879,000, there you go. Way ahead of anything. A scientist like correcting a journalist, that never <laughs> happens. <laughs> and so, so in, in that story, basically, the human race had split into these underground industrialists, the Morlocks, and these peace-loving, fairly naive uh, and docile humanoids called the uh, Eloi. So he arrives in this far distant future and, and finds the Eloi and thinks that's all of humanity and all the books are, are falling apart and society's crumbling but there's beautiful nature around and he doesn't see any evidence of agriculture or any way that that society can keep functioning. And of course, eventually it turns out that the Morlocks, who are this industrial underground race, are actually supplying the food and harvesting the Eloi for their meat. And so it's an interesting idea that we see it often in biology where species are driven down different evolutionary pathways and some eat others, you know, predators and prey, and to see that happening to human society is quite intriguing. And, and maybe when we go down a path of robotics, some people will rebel and, and want to go down the all-natural um, evolutionary route. And we could see some sort of division in human society. But time machine is interesting, isn't it, because it... Um if you like, it gives you an insight also into the concerns and fears of people of the time it was written, which is the, you know, Very the, much so. towards the beginning of the 20th century, just the end of the 19th century. And uh, you, if you like, you, you often see that in science fiction, don't you, uh, Brian, in that um, it, it, it speaks to the time that was written. For example, Star Trek, the original series, uh, which I, I see you listed as um, one of the fans, although you're more of a fan of the next generation, which is 1980s. But Star Trek, the original series, does have deal with some of the issues that were relevant in the 60s, like the Vietnam War, et cetera, doesn't it? Yeah, I think, I think it's important to realise that all science fiction, all good science fiction, isn't just about let's put a laser and a robot in there, but it's about saying something about the human condition uh, in a way that lets you look at it uh, in a different light. And so you can take something that is uh, perhaps is uh, hackneyed and old or, or invisible and you can put it in a different situation and all of a sudden it it becomes quite striking what's really going on. And so, um, you know, there are, there are issues in, um, in, in, in the original Star Trek of the Cold War, of race, of, um, of, of the issue of... Xen really, really pushed hard on the issue of xenophobia. You know, the question being asked over and over again in the original Star Trek was, what are you really afraid of? Um, and, uh, and the message inevitably was, uh, in, in many of the cases, was that there's really nothing to be afraid of if you work at understanding. And, uh, you know, it was, it was a pretty brave message to put out there in, in that, you know, climate of fear and mistrust. Well, because the original Star Trek series had uh, a black officer on board the bridge and it had um, uh, a, an alien, which the producers had to fight to keep. And actually, that ended up being the most popular character, Spock. It became very, very popular. Well, half alien. Half yeah, alien, so it's true. It's merging of alien true. and humans, yeah. Hybridisation. And Marianne, um, 2001 The Space Odyssey, I would have thought, would, would be an awesome... Uh, film for, uh, I mean, technical accuracy, to this day, it still looks remarkably fresh, but it's also um, a comment on human-machine relations, if you like, artificial intelligence, wasn't it? Yeah, and so, I mean, uh, my main interest uh, when I watch sci-fi is uh, looking for telltale signs of deception, 
on the part of the humans, the aliens, the technology, because it, that's probably the most sophisticated kind of cognitive capability um, on the planet that we be, that we know and do not understand. So, uh, you know, AI is a fairly young field; it's only 50 years old, and the the sort of um, controversy always is, okay, what is intelligence? You know, and when will we know that we've achieved artificial intelligence? And so when you, you watch these movies, you know, I'm, my students and I are constantly looking for it because intelligence is one of those things that you can't really define, but you know it when you see it. And um, if we could ever build a robot that could deceive, then we would know that we had created real intelligence. That's part of the premise in 2001, wasn't it? The, the robot actually, well, the PAL 9000, the... Uh, shipboard computer um, aboard the spaceship Discovery, that it actually goes crazy because it can't fashion a lie. It has to lie to its crew, and this eventually drives it completely crazy because yeah. it's required to think well, logically. Well, I mean, it's a, it's a paradox, really, um, and it's a very clever one uh, because, really, the, the capability for deception comes for free with language because you, you need what's called a theory of mind, so for, for us to communicate in a meaningful way, I have to somehow model your mind. And that um, It's a frightening concept. Possibly. <laughs> yeah. of mind it is. <laughs> it certainly does. <laughs> to what extent do you think 2001 sort of done a disservice, though, to the, the genre or, or the research on AI, and that we sort of assume that anything, any computer that's intelligent is eventually going to turn bad? Um, like the movie Moon, which is a more recent movie, which is really, really good. It has this computer that's deliberately supposed mm -hmm. to evoke how, and you sort of keep waiting for it to turn evil, and it sort of never yeah. really does. Well, unless robots sort of develop a social side, they, they will be uh, psychopathic. Why not? I mean, we have a lot of checks and balances in our human society, and the fact that we, we have empathy with each other simply because we, you know, I can figure out if I hit you that that's probably going to hurt, uh, because I have a body, and if you hit me, that's how I would feel. All right, but we don't, we don't, we won't have that empathy with uh, robots, and robots Rubbish. certainly will not have that empathy. <laughs> we'll give you an opportunity life. to ask questions uh, later in the piece, sir. I'm interjecting. Well, then <laughs> I'll invite you to ask questions, but I won't <laughs> invite you to interject. I'm afraid. Uh, so you were saying? What was I saying? Rubbish, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got an interesting point on that. Mm. You know, there's a classic Turing test. Yes. Haven't computers already passed that? We should explain what a Turing test is. Yeah, well, a Turing test is essentially where it was a definition from Alan Turing, a famous mathematician who devised various code-cracking routines in World War II and then uh, developed much of the basis of modern computing. And he, he said, basically, you could define computer intelligence as really being established if it could deceive a human into thinking it was another human. Yeah, so if you could interact through some wall, for instance, over, over some medium such that you couldn't tell that the computer wasn't another human interacting. And from what I understand is that artificial intelligence Well, has I mean, I think it depends on, on your position as to what, um, what you consider uh, being fooled. You know, is it fooling someone for five minutes, ten mm. minutes, an hour? You know, how long does it take? And uh, conversational agents are certain... No, I don't think anyone who works in AI would um, uh, suggest that they... Uh, were um, of human level intelligence and that's kind of the difference I think most uh, certainly roboticists would agree that uh, we've reached insect level intelligence and we've actually reached that for quite a long time mm -hmm. and uh, one of the robots that you'll see tonight um, he's a robot he's a soccer player and he'll chase a ball but he has no representation of what he's doing he's just reacting to his uh, sensory input and uh, so that, that that's in a way easy but going to this higher human level type of intelligence, uh, we are a very long way from. Doing how much that, has yeah. science fiction helped, um, say, in one field, say, artificial intelligence? How much has science fiction, whether in films or, or in books or even in artworks, um, helped in, in visualizing what it is that you expect? Because one of the things that we've learned about um, intelligence is we've learned more about human intelligence by trying to replicate it in artificial intelligence, mm. and we've learned it's way more complex than we ever expected. Ha has, has playing with concepts in, in science fiction helped, do you think, uh, in artificial intelligence research? Uh, well, of course, it, it has helped because it's, it's challenged people, it's made them think, it's, it's uh, forced us to consider questions uh, long before we actually have the technology. Um, and it's sort of painted a kind of a, a picture, but 
I think it, in a way it's limited. It's it, you know the the science fiction we uh, invent is very limited by the knowledge that we have, and um, I guess you know answer your question. Yeah, it, it's been useful, but. Um, a lot of the science fiction may not necessarily be terribly positive on the field. For example, you know, people have argued that um, the pursuit of uh, trying to build systems that could reason, because humans find reasoning really hard, uh, and that sort of took AI, AI off on a sort of path that maybe wasn't so useful. It took us a long time to realize that basic perception is probably the most challenging. This is the insect stuff, just being able to move around a room. Just being able to make sense of your sensory input. Mm. Yeah. So every, every science fiction fan holds up like the three laws of robotics as one of the mm. most beautiful things in science fiction literature. Um, do AI researchers spend any serious time discussing the value of the Asimov's laws of robotics? We should so explain what are. those rule laws are. You know, oh, you're going to put, really me, put me on the spot? Well, they're, uh, you they're know the first law. <laughs> the first law oh, is we should, should be able to do this. A, a robot shall not harm a human being or through an action cause a human being to come to harm. That's pretty good. Okay, and the second law? <laughs> well, it's generally about obeying humans' commands unless it violates the first law. And then the third law is like... Should not uh, harm itself. That should not harm itself unless, unless it, it violates, violates one or the first two. two the first yeah. Which is actually yeah. quite, you know, in, in Yeah, I mean, a great set of principles, and I think uh, the... Um, Can they be implemented in any practical way? Or? Well, okay, the first challenge, what is harm? If, if I'm a robot, <laughs> I have a different body to you, how do I make a judgment about harm? So, uh, you know, and what is a concept? So, uh, you know, it's, it, it, if you try to actually implement that, it breaks very, very quickly, but what is interesting is that almost everyone agrees that they are the three principles that need to be um, observed by any sort of robotic creature. But they'd have and to understand what those, all those things mean first. Yeah, <laughs> and it's about judgment. So, uh, however, it's also interesting to note that um, in the last maybe five years, the area of, of robotic sort of ethics has been growing and people are sort of asking, yeah, what, what kind of rules would we need to um, embed in, in a robot's architecture such that he, he would um, observe certain um, ethical uh, behaviour. Brian, you say that Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind is one of your favourites. Why is that? So, well, firstly, I should say that I vigorously would argue that that is science fiction. It doesn't need to be set in the future or have uh, spaceships to be science fiction. And so uh, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, as well as being a really nice film with sort of this nice fuzzy ending that says something positive about people, it... Uh, it's a film that really explores the nature of memory. That like how, how much does memory make you who you are? If you take away your memory, are you still the same person or not? And the science fiction in that is that you can ask that question around a beer and sort of argue about it, but what Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind does is it does its experiment and says, let's take away people's memory um, and how do they respond to that? Mm. And, uh, and uh, the answer, in, at least I think the movie is saying, is that you're something much more than your memories, that there's this fundamental soul or personality that makes you who you are. Because the premise is a fellow breaks up with a girl that is the love of his life and he wants to delete the memory of the girl so he won't feel this pain. And actually he realises that he's more than... It, it's just not the memory of her, it's something else. Something, and it, we, we often come back to this in sci-fi. This, it, it's, the, it's, it, it's an ode to the human spirit, often sci-fi, isn't it? Because it always comes back to, no matter how much technology, how much stuff happens, you always come back to the human spirit is, is greater. So in that case, the interesting thing, one of the interesting things about that film is, yes, you're right that a lot of people would not consider that sci-fi, but I agree with you, it is. But secondly, um, that technology actually exists. It does exist. To be able to delete memories, we're actually in the first, uh, first stages of it. If you check, I think it was issue 28 of Cosmos, you'll, uh, you'll see the cover story was actually memory engineers. It, it actually does exist where people who have post-traumatic stress disorder um, and they have memories they want to get rid of, whether, you know, fighting in a war or being trapped in a bushfire, you can actually delete that. It's not very accurate at the moment, but this... And, and the fascinating thing is this film was based on real science, and it sounds like it's crazy, but one day it could happen. It's interesting that you talk about the human spirit as a, as a strong motivation. I mean, that goes right back to the early days of science fiction. Jules Verne, which was almost the crossover point from adventure to science fiction, was all about that. And it was set in the age of exploration, of course, the mid-19th century, when much of the world still was unknown. And something like Journey to the Centre of the Earth, which was another science fiction movie that I listed, 
is terrific because you can imagine it could almost be real. You know, although mm -hmm. obviously it is a hot core at the centre of the Earth. Well, now we know a lot more about it. Now we know a lot more about it. Yeah. Back then, just like Mars could have been inhabited, those could have been canals. Then this could have been real. It could it could be a hollow world and. And so we've had explorers crossing the globe and finding the new, the new world in the Americas and Australia and going down Antarctica. Why not go into the centre of the Earth? And even if you look at science fiction today, things like Star Trek, it's very much about exploring the new frontier. So it's, it's calling to that inner spirit, I think, of humans to be wanderers and vagrants and explorers and finding out about the unknown. And that's uh, why often, is it, is it why often, I should ask perhaps, uh, why often science fiction does deal with space? A lot of the, the books that were, and movies that were listed were um, very much the kind of what you called lasers and spaceships. Um, is that because that's the next age of exploration? Yeah, well, I mean, you look at Google Earth today and you can peer down to a resolution of a few hundred metres any square metre on Earth. So the sort of the, the appeal of the unknown is almost gone. Maybe go to the deep ocean, that's about it. So space is a big frontier. Now it's a bit twee to think about space the final frontier, but it really is. And even the solar system itself offers huge potential for human to find new environments and new things to, to uncover and new resources, new ideas. And eventually if we get to the stars, whole new frontiers. And so I think it comes back again to that human yearning for something that's totally different, totally new, no one else has seen it, and space mm. is what holds that. And one something else no one else has seen is um, aliens. Uh, one of the books listed was Contact. Uh, I think it was you again, Brian. Um, and that's an interesting case because you have a scientist, Carl Sagan, who's now deceased, uh, an astrophysicist, writing a science fiction story. In fact, the only book he's ever written, science fiction. Um, that's intriguing. Would you say, you've read quite a bit of science fiction, Brian, would you say that having a scientist write science fiction, did it feel different? Yeah, so Contact is a very special book to me and to many other astronomers because I guess the simplest way to describe it, so for those that haven't seen the film or read the book, the, it, the idea is that there's this astronomer who detects a radio signal from um, intelligent life with a message for Earth. And the reason why that book is special is because it's, what I like to think is this is how it would actually happen. If, I mean, it's a, it's a novel, it's a bit fanciful, but it's how it might actually happen. So a lot of other books you have to sort of let your belief go, say, OK, suppose we can travel faster than light, or suppose that you know, there are these rogue computers that want to take over the world. But Contact doesn't ask you to suspend belief. It just says, at some point, this is probably going to happen, and this is how it might play out. And it really touches on the fundamental issue that this is one of the biggest, you know, if, you, if you're a sort of a, a philosophical type person, you might come up with all these profound questions uh, that you think don't have answers. And one of those profound questions is, you know, are we alone? And science can answer that question. And what this book argues is that if we have that answer, overnight everything would change, but in other way nothing would change. Um, in, the, in the book, once the signal comes, everyone's still fighting and arguing and it all becomes about politics and money. But on the other hand, some, some aspects of spirituality are now just irrelevant, while other people, particularly the hero of the book, the scientist, who is very the start of the book is very rigorously atheist and not spiritual, ends by realising there's a little bit more out there than just her, her maths and her computer programs. Because she has to believe, yeah. does she not? Um, and with the, with one of the things I quite enjoy, it, very real, it seems very realistic, the idea that um, suddenly a whole bunch of groupies and, for want of a better word, hippies, uh, descend on the telescopes and it becomes a new religion, you know, a kind of new age religion. <laughs> the vegans are communicating with us, man, and people are wearing tinfoil hats saying, yeah, let's communicate with the vegans, man. <laughs> But there's also a, a, a favourite scene is, is that a van uh, pull up outside the telescope with a banner saying alien abduction insurance. <laughs> and um, it sounds funny until you, you learn that the director actually saw that company advertising their, their business in real life and asked them if they would appear in the movie. <laughs> One of the other topics that, um, uh, that, that really grabbed your fancy, Barry, was um, multiverses and the idea of the grandfather paradox of time travel. Can you speak to that? Well, the big argument in time travel always been we can't go back in time because it almost inevitably creates this paradox where we could perform actions that mean that we could never have gone back in time to perform the actions in the first place and the classic case was you go back and through either inaction or action you kill your grandfather and if you did that of course then you, your father wouldn't have been born and you wouldn't have been born and you wouldn't be able to go back and do it and and that's always seems to have created this this paradox this illogic that that means you there's no way we could go back and interact 
with anything in time. And the deeper you go back in time, the more chance there is that that could have cascading effects such that the future would be totally different. Well, the idea of multiverses, and I don't know when the idea first came up, but there was quite a famous um, sequel written to The Time Machine, an unofficial sequel, um, called The Time Shift. And it was written almost 100 years after the original was published. And when it was out of copyright. When it was out of copyright. But it's <laughs> by quite a famous author. I can't remember Stephen his name. Baxter, Stephen Baxter. Stephen Baxter, it was, yeah. It's a very good book, much longer than the original. It explores a whole range of other issues, but it's all about going back in time rather than just going forward in time. And he solved these by, by saying that, well, really, there are... And it, this comes back very strongly to real scientific uh, theory, that there may well not be one universe, but many, many universes, and they can be created through physical actions, or they're, they're multiple big bangs, black holes may spawn off um, new universes. And the idea here is that you go back and change time, that's fine. You're in this new timeline, this new universe, and the one you are in is forever gone and inaccessible. It's split off. You've but s- you've but split at the off point at which you yeah. split the universe, mm. they were identical. And mm. from that point, you're following that new trajectory and the old universe is following its trajectory. And that can happen an infinite number of times because the universe is infinite and so on. And it was an intriguing idea, and I remember when I first read the book, I was sort of sat back and thought, that's actually very satisfactory. I mean, it's, it's rare that I read a science fiction book or, or watch a movie and, and think that's a satisfactory explanation. Usually it's just a, it's just a, a gimmick. Um, hmm. yeah. Marianne, earlier we were talking about um, Isaac Asimov and the Three Laws. There's, there's one, uh, one uh, of his um, books that have been made into, uh, into the film that probably most people would have come across or some would have come across, uh, the Will Smith um, mm. iRobot. Mm. Um, what did you think of the, some of the issues that were dealt with in that, in that uh, artwork? <laughs> uh, well, I think that wasn't a very popular movie, was it? No. No, I think uh, people were fairly unimpressed with the underlying concepts. But what is interesting This was a future where the, you, you had yeah. domesticated robots and everyone had them and basically there was a, a takeover. They were going to yeah. take over the world. Mm. Right. Which is I, very I think common, one very of the dystopian. Ro- one of those robots did um, uh, learn to deceive mm. in the end. So, so that was cool. But uh, the actual um, technology itself is, uh, you know, the, the, the bodies of the robots and, and what they could do and uh, was very suggestive, I think. And uh, Suggestive in a good way or a bad yeah, way? Yeah, well, in a good way, yeah. You yeah, thought it was relatively accurate. It, um, so the visual inspired li- people often to the visualization build robots yeah. uh, that um, sort of had that sort of bionic type feel. Yeah. And then to, c- to contrast that, there was that Asimov's book, Positronic Man, which was made into the movie The Bicentennial Man, and and that really took just the path of one robot from being a pretty primitive yeah. domestic robot through to being some incredibly advanced robot, mm. and just followed his story through two hundred years. Mm. And, that was a very different take on it, where society went on and did its thing and developed, and he contributed to it you know, by inventing all this new technology, um, mainly for himself, so that he could become more human. And then in the end, he got to the stage where, where um, he was sort of satisfied that, that um, he had met that goal. Well, perhaps we can return that after we've had our break. We're going to go to a 10-minute break now, so please do uh, avail yourself of the bar um, down at the end, and we'll be back in uh, at 6:45 thanks very much